members, uh, Senate Bill 987, Senator Reeves, you're recognized on Senate Bill 987. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, committee members. Before I present these uh, two bills today, I wanted you to know I will be declaring Rule 13 because I am a pharmacist and I own a pharmacy if ultimately this comes to a vote on the floor. I want to introduce to you today Senate Bill 987 for your consideration. Uh, this bill mirrors a concept that is being considered all around the country right now where PBMs are actually being removed from Medicaid programs or at a very minimum being reduced to their original role as single claims processors. If possible, Mr. Chairman, I'd simply like to use this bill as a backdrop and go into recess and use this as an opportunity to do a short presentation for the committee. Members, if there is no objection, we'll uh, go into recess and uh, hear the presentation. Okay, very good. We're in recess. Members, I was elected March 13, 2018. Two days after that, March 15, 2018, I stood up there with that beautiful lady, my wife, and got sworn into office. And if you would have asked me an hour after that day what I hope to get done as a state senator, I would have told you, well, I've got a lot to learn, and I've got a lot of people to meet, and I've met a lot of people. But I also would have said, I hope I'm able to move the dial in some health care related issues. And there would have been no issue that's more important or more dear to my heart than the slow demise and the eradication of community pharmacies and independent pharmacies around the state of Tennessee and around the country. Much of that demise is driven by the anti-competitive and oftentimes, um, oftentimes deceptive and sometimes even egregious practices by the PBM industry. Members, my family has been practicing pharmacy for 120 years in Rutherford County. There's my great, great, great uncle's pharmacy on the square in Rutherford County that was in 1900. There's a picture of my dad and his partner in 1980 uh, when they opened up one of their pharmacies, had one of the first computers in the whole entire state of Tennessee in 1980. That was a period of time in 1980 when you could buy a medication for $5 and you could sell it for 10 it was a time when pharmacists and doctors and patients had strong relationships and they were able to work together. But at the end of the day, every single thing ran through one filter. What's in the best interest of patients? Personally for their families, clinically for their health, and financially for them and their, and their, um, their, their, their patients and their, their families. The emergence of the PBM industry, honestly, when it first came out in the 1980s, was a very, very good thing. And it was supported by a number of pharmacies everywhere, um, everywhere you looked around the state. But over the last 30 or 40 years, the PBM industry, I truly believe, has overreached. And I believe it's become incredibly confusing for patients. It's frustrating for prescribers. It's unsustainable for the profession of pharmacy. And I think it's too expensive for the state of Tennessee and our Medicaid program and our state employees. If nothing else in the world, this piece of legislation has got people saying, what in the world's a PBM? I've had a lot of people ask me in the last few weeks, what in the world is a PBM? Well, it stands for Pharmacy Benefit Managers. As opposed to trying to talk to you about specifically about the PBMs, I thought I would just tell you a little story real quickly. This is a pharmacist by the name of John Taylor. He's a fictional story I made up little pharmacist named John Taylor, and he decided to open up a pharmacy called Taylor's Pharmacy in Cookville, Tennessee. Mr. Chairman. Over the next number of years, he built a strong, strong relationship with physicians and with dentists and with patients in his community. 100% of his business was cash back in those days, 100%. He actually ran charge accounts inside his stores, but he had such a good relationship with people in the community. It was very common. He'd come in after hours and fill a prescription for somebody or meet a patient on a Sunday afternoon after church for an antibiotic. Uh, it was very much relational in the 1960s. So you can only imagine that John Taylor was thrilled to death when his son, John Taylor II, decided to go to pharmacy school. They called him JT. He went to the UT College of Pharmacy, graduated in 1986, and he was excited as he could be to come home and work in his dad's pharmacy. He moved home and he was just excited to have the opportunity to work with people he'd grown up with in school and sports and church. So he graduated in 86 and came home. By 1990, he was actively working in his dad's store and a new concept really came into the marketplace called PBMs, Prescription or Pharmacy Benefit Managers. It was pharmacy cards. And I honestly can say that JT as well as other pharmacies around the state welcomed 
PBMs. That, I was working near that period of time when they first came into the marketplace. They offered two significant values. One, they offered drug formularies. They actually gave some bookends in place on what medications people could take and could not take, and it really gave a nice, robust for formulary for what physicians could prescribe. The second thing they did is they provided claims processing. You could walk into a pharmacy, get a $5 generic or a $10 brand, and it really gave some clarity to what patients were going to be spending at the time of the point of sale, like a credit card. And then a few weeks later, the pharmacy would get paid. It really was an incredible innovation in the marketplace, and it was supported by physicians, dentists, pharmacists, patients, employers, health insurance. It was a wonderful thing in the 1990s. By 1995, those formularies started to get tighter and tighter in Taylor's Pharmacy. And they started notice, noticing they had Tier 1 formularies and Tier 2 formularies, and it was harder and harder to get the medications that sometimes the physicians wanted the patients to have, but pharmacists and physicians would still work together to make that happen. But honestly, it was pretty disappointing to JT whenever he found out that a number of the Tier 1 medications were actually tied directly to rebates that went right back to the PBMs over the course of the month as prescriptions, prescriptions were filled. By the time 2000 got around, the formulary process got even a little bit more tighter. Medications were getting more expensive. but. You could have medications that were filled, medications that were not filled. Well, Taylor's Pharmacy really did not have any choice but to hire more, more, more technicians. They actually had to hire a couple of technicians to come in and manage because every PBM has a different formulary. They all have different drug lists. So they had to hire more technicians to come in and actually manage things. And the PBM started a process called prior authorizations. Some medications are approved, some medications are not approved, some medications were, were put on pending. But many, many times the medications were simply put on hold and recommended another med on the list many times that were tied back to those rebates. By 2005, a huge trucking company opened up in Cookville, Tennessee. It was, a, it was a great thing for that, and they had a number of employees, but I remember the day when JT actually met with the first patient that walked into his store with tears running down her face and saying, JT, I can no longer use your pharmacy. Unfortunately, I got a phone call at my house last night from my PBM that said moving forward, I would have to get my medications directly from their pharmacy. She said it was going to be a much cheaper option, and I really did not have any choice but to go with them at the time. She was very, very upset about that, but moving forward, she was going to get her meds shipped to her from Ohio. So every single customer that walked into JT's pharmacy, he would run it through the claims, and he would see that right there. Last, real, re, last fill at retail, must use mail order. Well, by 2010, Taylor's Pharmacy was continuing to struggle, was dealt another blow when on the first day of the year, first or second day of the year, they filled a prescription, and it was $30 below his actual acquisition cost. He called the PBM, and he said, and he said this is actually $30 below my cost. Whomever he was speaking with the PBM said, well, sir, your contract changed the first of the year. And he said, well, shouldn't I be notified my contract was changed at the first of the year? And they said, it's your responsibility, sir, to keep up with when your pharmacy contracts are actually changing. He said, well, I, this medication is $30 below my cost. And really and truly, he was kind of given a take it or leave it uh, comment from the PBM. And they actually recommended that he transferred it to another prescription, to another pharmacy in the area, which honestly happened to be owned by that PBM. By 2015, with margins shrinking and customers continue to be forced to other pharmacies against their will, Taylor's Pharmacy was stunned when they were actually told by their PBMs that all prescriptions were now going to be audited. So they put an auditor in place that they sent in to Taylor's Pharmacy, audited all of his prescriptions that he had been filled by that PBM, and one such prescription was a prescription for a man who had been getting insulin from Taylor's Pharmacy for 10 years. He had a new prescription on file that he had been getting for the last 10 months, and the auditor found a small clerical error, nothing fraudulent, a simple record-keeping error on day supply. That auditor immediately dinged him for that, went back and took all 10 months worth of the fills away from him, cost of medications and the fees for $2,000 for Taylor's Pharmacy by 2015. Well, in 2018, 95% of every single one of Taylor's Pharmacies are now firmly in the grips of PBMs in Cookville. His business margins, margins are dismal. His employees are overworked and discouraged. Patients really have no choice but to use whom their PBM wants them to use. And he had no choice but to sell his pharmacy, as many independents have done. 
and he actually ended up selling it to one of the PBM owned pharmacies in his in his back door. And of course, let's not forget about his son, John Taylor III, who had always wanted to go into the family pharmacy business and be part of it as well, but he was discouraged by both his dad and his granddad from going into that profession because this wonderful profession had been wrecked at the hands of the PBM industry. So where are we today? Here's where we are today. Prescribers have little to no control over what medications their patients take. If you don't believe me, talk to your doctors. They have very little control nowadays. It's driven by the formulators. Number two, patients are steered away from their community pharmacies and have to take medications many times on the PBM formula, even if they at times would like to try something else. Number three, pharmacists, members pharmacists are fighting for survival. They're fighting for survival in community pharmacies, long-term care, home infusion, specialty across our state. They're fighting for survival, shrinking margins, audit, getting audits every single month. And I can honestly say this today. If you don't hear me say anything else, please hear me say this. Tennessee will not have any independent pharmacists left. There won't be any left in 10 years if we don't make, don't make an act and do something on this to actually try to make a difference. The PBM industry, there are now three major PBMs in America. They have 80% of the market share. They all own their own pharmacies. They're servicing 230 million patients in America, generating 400 billion in annual revenue. Here's my big picture. The pendulum has swung too far. It swung too far. Just to see the math, it looks like this. Typical drug like an Eli Lilly is $135. You can see an example of it. On the other end, the pharmacist is getting paid $7. Maybe the wholesaler is $20. In this one specific example, which is an actual example that was pulled, the $432 in the middle is the money that actually went to pay for the processing fees for the PBM. The pendulum has swung too far. And don't take it from me, members. You, you can't hardly watch the news nowadays. Drug middleman in Kentucky owns $123.5 million in middle fees. Wall Street Journal talks about the Medicare Part D business up $9 billion. Pharmacy middleman in Ohio, $223.7 million. West Virginia is in the process of completely eliminating PBMs and only using, doing it themselves. Arkansas is leading the way against anti-competitive actions of PBMs. U.S. Congress is bringing in PBM to meet with them. Attorney General Yost seeking $16 million. Obamacare has actually benefited the PBMs. Once again, the pendulum, it's just swung, it's just swung too far. So the bill I have in front of you, the bill I have in front of you, Bill 9987, would basically say, let's remove PBMs in the state employees' prescriptions and from the Medicaid. And honestly, I don't know if Commissioner Roberts is in here today, but I actually have full confidence that in time, he's a smart guy, he has smart people working for him. I really think in time it's something we ought to take a hard look at. But for the time being, I'd like to general sub this bill, and I'd actually like to move forward with Senate Bill 650, which is an actual bill that I believe will provide some immediate, meaningful relief to pharmacists and help out patients and prescribers in our state. Members, without objection, uh, Senate Bill 987 to the general sub. Okay, Senator Reeves, you're recognized on Senate Bill 650. All right, members, thank you. I uh, have a motion by Chairman Watson on the bill. Uh, Senator Swan is uh, second on the bill. Uh, Senator Reeves, I see that there's an amendment on the bill. It's um, 006583, is that correct? Yes. Uh, chair will move the amendment. Uh, Chairman Watson is second on the amendment. Uh, you're free to explain the amendment, sir. Members, you should have a handout that really breaks down what I'm about to say in front of you. But it's very simple. This bill does three things. Number one, it actually establishes some certain rights for pharmacies and pharmacists when prescription drug claims are audited by PBMs. In essence, that means it's going to prevent the PBMs from recouping claims, including the cost of the drug, for non-fraudulent clerical or record record-keeping areas. Clearly, if there's fraud, by all means, the pharmacist needs to be held accountable. But if they're clerical or record-keeping errors, they can no longer claw it all back. It allows pharmacies the right to correct the clerical errors or the record-keeping errors by submitting amended claims. That's the first thing it does. Second thing it does is requires increased transparency and disclosure of all fees charged to pharmacies by PBMs at the times of claim processing so the pharmacist doesn't ultimately get its payment and notice there's a number of fees in there on the back end they weren't expecting. And the third thing this does is it establishes certain rights for pharmacies regarding contracts with PBMs. It gives the pharmacist professional judgment when determining when to dispense a drug or other product to a patient, both clinically and financially. It requires 30 days advance notice to the pharmacy of any network changes. Pharmacists shouldn't just be surprised one day that the contract has changed. 
requires mutual agreements by PBMs and pharmacists regarding contract terms. It prevents PBMs from using untrue, deceptive, or misleading advertising. And it prevents PBMs from engaging in the pattern of practice of reimbursing pharmacies or pharmacists less than what they might actually pay an affiliated pharmacy, maybe one they own, for the same drug or dispensed product or service. That's the three major things it does with some bullet points under it, Mr. Chairman. And that's my bill. Okay, members, you've heard an explanation of the amendment. Are there questions in regards to the amendment? Seeing none, you're voting on the amendment. Those in favor of the amendment say aye, aye, opposed like sign. Amendment's on the bill. We're back on the bill. Are there questions for the sponsor of the uh, Senate Bill 650? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, take the vote. Senator Ackberry? Aye. Votes aye. Senator Gresham? Aye. Votes aye. Senator Johnson? Aye. Votes aye. Senator Lumberg? Aye. Votes aye. Senator Nicely? Aye. Votes aye. Senator Sutherland? Aye. Votes aye. Senator Swan? Aye. Votes aye. Senator Watson? Aye. Votes aye. Chairman Bailey? Aye. Chairman, you have nine members voting aye. Senate Bill 650 moves to the Committee on Finance. Yeah, members on behalf of Tennessee Pharmacist, I thank you. Uh, Senator Reeves, you uh, have done yeoman's work on this legislation, and I know that uh, you've worked with a lot of parties to try to get to this point, so uh, uh, glad to see your legislation move forward. 